Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you all very much indeed for um, turning up. Uh, the rule of law is an expression uh, that I think most of us uh, have been familiar with as an expression uh, for very, very uh, many years. We've heard politicians including it among a list of desirable things, uh, usually along with freedom and democracy and things of that kind. We've heard judges using it. Uh, they tend to say Parliament couldn't possibly have intended uh, to enact this because that would violate the rule of law. Uh, and we've heard the expression used in very uh, um, dignified international instruments uh, like the preamble to the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and the European Convention of Human Rights and the Treaty of European Union. Uh, but on none of these occasions, uh, on the whole, has anybody ever paused, having invoked the rule of law, to say what they actually mean by it. Uh, and then, in 2005, Section 11, the Constitutional Reform Act of that year, by amendment, enacted, nothing in this act shall detract from the existing constitutional principle of the rule of law. Well, now, <coughs> uh, from that, uh, we uh, derive that there is an existing constitutional principle uh, and that the Act doesn't detract uh, from it. Uh, but anybody who looks through uh, the back of the Act or indeed elsewhere uh, to find a definition doesn't find one. Uh, and I, my own view is very wise not to try and give one because uh, of the difficulty um, of it. But, I mean, this now is recognized by statute as a principle of our constitution, that is, of the most basic rules that govern uh, this uh, country. Uh, and that, of course, means that a time is bound to come, and has indeed already come, when uh, people in court invoke it, and they say, we're relying on this constitutional principle. Uh, and so, uh, sort of vague obfuscation as to what it actually means uh, cannot uh, be pursued. Now, I've attempted, um, first of all, in a, a sentence uh, to sum up, in, I'm afraid, a rather legalistic way, uh, what the crux of this is. Uh, and I think it is really this, uh, that all individuals and organizations within the state, whether public or private, are bound by and entitled to the benefit of, quite important then, laws prospectively promulgated uh, and publicly administered in the courts. Uh, now that's quite a mouthful, and what uh, this little book really consists of is trying to spell out in, in a little bit more detail, and indeed in a way uh, that um, is intended to be extremely accessible to anybody, whether they're a lawyer or not, is what this actually means. And so I've suggested eight principles. Uh, the first of these, you may say, well, goodness me, what could be more obvious than that, um, is that the law should, so far as possible, be clear, accessible, uh, and intelligible. If we're all bound to obey the law, uh, and if we're entitled to the benefit of it, we do need, without undue difficulty, uh, to be able to find what the law is. And you may say, well, surely there's no problem about that. Well, there is a problem. Uh, with governments churning out thousands of pages of legislation every year, and those thousands of pages of legislation being uh, supplemented uh, by um, uh, thousands more pages of, of ministerial orders made under statute, it is extremely difficult to know what the law is, not least because Provisions are amended, and then the amendment is amended, and then the amendment to the amendment is amended. And there's a case, which I recount in the book, uh, where a man uh, was the subject of a compensation order for 66,000 pounds, and it was only at a very late stage, and by chance, that it emerged that the order under which uh, this order had been made had been revoked seven years earlier. And nobody could have found it out. 
However, pointing a, a finger of accusation at Parliament isn't good enough because the judges themselves are given to extreme prolixity and length and complication. And they do not do, in my opinion, what they might do uh, to make the law uh, as simple and straightforward as they might. Uh, and this is true at the highest level where you get five people all giving their own take on something. That's point one. Point two is that by and large, uh, we should be governed by law and not discretion. We don't want, by and large, to be subject to the arbitrary whim of some autocrat, uh, whether he be a minister or an official or a judge. And it occurred to me this morning uh, that you couldn't really get a much better example than that, uh, than the execution of John the Baptist by Herod. Why did he do it? Because of something terrible that John the Baptist had done? No, uh, because he promised his daughter uh, that in return for her wonderful dancing, uh, he would give her anything she wanted. Um, and anything more utterly contrary to the rule of law than that, it would be quite hard to imagine. Uh, the third thing I um, uh, elaborate a little is equality before the law. And again, you'll say, well, that's quite obvious. Uh, surely we're all equal before the law. Well, um, slaves weren't equal. Uh, a number of uh, religious believers were not equal until relatively uh, recently. Uh, women were not equal um, until uh, recently. And there is a tendency, not just in this country but elsewhere, uh, to treat non-nationals unequally. Uh, not simply in an immigration context, uh, but for other purposes as well. Fourth point I make. Uh, is that the exercise of public powers, i.e. powers publicly conferred by statute, uh, should be exercised by those on whom they're conferred reasonably, fairly, honestly, and importantly, for the purpose for which they are conferred. I mean, many of you will recall the example when the Terrorism Act, the Terrorism Act, was invoked uh, to um, exclude a man who told the Home Secretary at the Labour Party conference that he was talking rubbish. Uh, it, it, it was the Foreign Secretary, not, not, not the Home Secretary. Um, so we, uh, it's a very important principle. We elect members of Parliament. We give them authority to make laws. They make laws. The laws bind us. But we don't give it, the people who are given powers by those laws a blank check. We give them power to do what the statute says they can or must do. Sixth point, dispute resolution. Uh, we live in a society where private vengeance is discounted. If you are owed a lot of money by somebody, uh, you don't um, hire a lot of heavies to go and threaten the man uh, until he pays you, as used to happen in um, Russia after. Um, glass and Austin, um, so on. But there is a corollary of this. I mean, if in the last resort, I'm not advocating resort to litigation, litigation does not, on the whole, lead to happiness. Uh, I'm not certainly discounting arbitration, mediation, conciliation, in other words, of resolving cases out of court. They're entirely beneficial. But in the last resort, uh, if we have rights to assert or to defend, we ought to be able to go to a court established by the law of the land in order to get an answer, assuming uh, that it isn't a frivolous or stupid or utterly uh, hopeless uh, contention. That, you may say, again, is completely obvious, but we all, I think, know uh, that the expense of litigation uh, is such uh, as to make it very, very difficult and a formidable undertaking uh, for anybody except the very rich or the legally aided, a diminishing group, uh, to go to court uh, for almost any purpose. This isn't a new problem. Uh, in uh, the 1650s, uh, someone said, you know, the law is beyond remedy. It costs 10 pounds to recover five. 
Well, it's a problem that uh, some centuries later is still with us, as is the problem of delay. Uh, it's not as bad as Italy, for example, uh, but it does take much too long uh, for cases uh, to reach court. Uh, I should have mentioned human rights. There are those who say human rights have, have nothing to do with it. If the law is absolutely clear, the law should be observed, and it doesn't matter uh, how appalling uh, the things are that the law prescribes. Well, I um, passionately disagree with that view, and no doubt Charmy uh, disagrees with it even more passionately, um, and it may be we will uh, talk about it. Uh, but my own contention is that while human rights are not universal, nobody is going to say that women have equal rights in uh, Saudi Arabia uh, to Western European uh, countries, but within any given society, I think there is a high degree of consensus as to what the most uh, important uh, rights are. Uh, my uh, next principle is that the state should provide a fair trial. Uh, again, completely obvious, and you may say, well, of course, uh, criminal trials should be fair, civil trials should be fair. Uh, I also address what I call hybrid or sort of mixed trials, which are not criminal uh, and are not strictly civil either. But, for example, it's a case uh, where a prisoner is seeking uh, release on parole, and there's a hearing parole before the parole board. Or, uh, let us say, somebody is the subject of an application for a control order uh, by the Home Secretary. Now, these are situations in which there have been, uh, and are on the statute book, departures uh, from what has hitherto been regarded as almost the most fundamental ingredient of a fair trial, which is the requirement uh, that a person who's the subject of an adverse order, like being refused parole or being made the subject of a control order, should know what the case is against him uh, and have a complete opportunity to argue it in a forum where the judge or decision maker uh, has received no material which he has not. Now that's been departed from uh, because for grounds of national security, uh, a provision has been made that there are situations uh, in which the decision maker can be given material which is not shown to the defendant, if we call him that, not shown to his lawyers, uh, but uh, shown to a special advocate uh, who is shown the material uh, but cannot communicate uh, with the defendant after he's seen it. And so he can't take instructions and say, well, um, what do I ask this witness? Do you know him? Is he a reliable man? What were your feelings with him? So he, he can't do any of that. Uh, and and uh, the last uh, of my eight uh, principles uh, is uh, that uh, the state should comply with its duties in international law as it should with its duties in national law. Now, international law covers um, very significant areas of uh, uh, international life, the law of the sea, the law of the air, the law of outer space, law of Antarctica, etc., etc., and things uh, closer to uh, home. Uh, the ministerial code, which binds all ministers in this country, uh, says that they should comply uh, with international as well as national law. Uh, and, of course, uh, international law governs the use of force. And as uh, Sir Michael Wood, uh, without at that stage betraying any view at all, it was after he'd retired, uh, he said about the war of Iraq, in Iraq, uh, it, it really raises no significant question of principle. It either was authorized or it wasn't by the Security Council of the United Nations. So that is the crux uh, of, 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 of this debate. The, the, the government and its immediate advisers uh, said yes, it was authorized. Uh, a large body of opinion, um, including my own, uh, says it was uh, not authorized. 
So, um, in conclusion, at this stage, uh, we live in a world which is riven by differences of race, religion, nationality, wealth, etc., cetera, uh, et cetera. Uh, and there are hosts of problems that no set of legal principles uh, is ever going to uh, overcome. But the principles that I've been talking about, um, comprised under the general heading of the rule of law, are very widely accepted among the nations of the world. Uh, I've suggested, and I suggest again, that it's the nearest we're likely to come to a universal secular religion. Uh, and I've also suggested and suggested again uh, that observance of these uh, principles is the best recipe that the world has yet devised, uh, not only for good government at home, uh, but also for peace, order, and cooperation uh, among the nations of the world. Thank you very, very much indeed. Well, thanks, Tom, for that very pithy tutorial. I've, I've got my eight points now and intend to use them. Um, looking at your eight points, um, it seems to me that probably the most contentious would be um, the human rights component for some, for some critics of your, of your theory um, and possibly the international law component. I think that I'm um, just, just preempting what some um, critics might say. They might say that that's where you're pushing at the boundaries, are you not, of, of, of what we traditionally would, would think of as the rule of law that might more minimalistically just be, well, equality before the law um, and, and, and maybe fair trials, independent judges and so on. But, but in both the human rights principle that you've introduced and the international law principle, you're looking at the content of the law rather than just having a process and, and having equality of access to, to that process. What, what, do you, what would you say to, for example, those who currently want to scrap the Human Rights Act or, or um, dilute it in some way um, on, the, on the basis that it somehow impacts upon parliamentary sovereignty, which you've also spoken in favour of, I think, many times? Yes, I am an, um, an unashamed um, supporter of the principle of parliamentary sovereignty, which means of course, that Parliament, save in matters uh, in which it's lent its authority to somebody else, uh, is sovereign. And as Professor Bogdanor has said, what the Queen in, act, in Parliament enacts is law. Well, so it is. But so far as the Human Rights Act is concerned, Parliament has passed an Act of Parliament uh, that says public authorities in the United Kingdom, including courts, shall act in a manner consistently with the rights set out in the schedule to the act, which are the main rights in the convention. And there's no option. It doesn't say it may apply these things, or it can if it likes to, or needn't, whatever. It, it says it must. Now, um, Parliament could revoke that. Uh, the effect of revocation would be extremely uh, limited, because we're still bound by the convention. We signed it in 1951, we drafted it, we were the first country to sign it, and the first country to ratify it. So we've been bound by it since 1951, and all we did in 1998 was to say, instead of having to wait for years and spend a lot of money going to Strasbourg to try and assert your rights there without the benefit <coughs> for the European judges of any judgment in this country, uh, you can assert your rights here, and the courts must give effect to them. Uh, the, the result of that, partly, uh, has been um, that our record in Strasbourg, while not immaculate, has been much better. We had uh, had about 150 cases in which the United Kingdom was held to have violated the convention, and although I don't know how many there have been since our courts were applying the act, it, it would only be uh, a handful. Uh, and to those who say these are spurious rights and why are they so important,
uh, I would say, and I'm afraid Charmy's heard me say this before, well, which of these rights exactly would you wish to do without? Would you not wish to protect the right to life? Would you not wish to prohibit torture and cruel and inhuman treatment or punishment? Would you not want uh, to eliminate uh, slavery? Would you not want to give a potent guarantee of personal liberty? Would you not want to give people a, a fair trial? And uh, so on. There is, uh, I suggest nothing here that any of us would gladly forego. Uh, although, of course, it is true that the further you go from the very, very central core of some of these rights, the more disputatious they may become. Uh, turning to Shami's second point, I mean, it is very important to understand that international law is law. It's not national law, uh, but it is the law which the nations themselves have made. And nothing could be clearer than the fact that with two world wars behind them, the nations of the world, 1945, resolved to adopt the United Nations Charter, which prohibits the use of force, except in self-defense, or with the authority of the Security Council, given under Chapter 7. After all, other means of resolving problems have been resolved. Now, uh, there is one gray area as to whether the use of force is legitimate uh, to prevent an imminent humanitarian catastrophe. Uh, that isn't spelt out in the Charter. There's a school of thought that supports it. Uh, there are other nations uh, that don't support it. I think the United Nations, uh, the United States, does not support uh, th that. But we're not, in a recent context, certainly not in an Iraqi context, involved with that. Uh, nobody suggested there was an imminent humanitarian catastrophe in Iraq, and nobody suggested uh, that we were entitled to invade in self-defense. Uh, so it is, as I said earlier, a question of authority. Uh, uh, but I, I do think the importance of international law as a means of uh, governing the conduct of nations is hugely important. Uh, and uh, as I think I've said in what was intended to be a witty aphorism, uh, the law of the jungle is no more acceptable simply because it's a big jungle. Well, just to push you just a little step further, Tom, you see, I, I, I suspect, well, I, I noticed all the nods of approval in this room, but to go back to your rhetorical question on human rights, which of these, which of these rights would you like to discard? <laughs> torture, protection from torture, free speech, fair trial... I'm thinking of some former Home Secretaries on both sides of the aisle, actually, that I've had the pleasure of discussing these <laughs> matters with. And what they would probably say, if pushed, in response to your question, which of these rights would you like to discuss? They would say none for, for our citizens and people like us. The problem, let's face it, the, the, the woolly mammoth in this great room is what we really want to do is to deport foreign nationals to places of torture. And that's the link with the international law argument as well. It's about how big the jungle is and, or how big the, the society in which you say we have a legal system is and who gets protected. Well, as Shami points out absolutely correctly, uh, as you'd expect, um, the decision of the European Court of Justice given uh, before the Human Rights Act so it's not in any way a product of that, is a decision which lawyers know as Chahal against the United Kingdom. Chahal uh, was a Sikh terrorist. Uh, we wanted to support, uh, deport him to India. Uh, he said that if he was deported to India, he was at grave risk of torture and uh, severe maltreatment, and that was accepted as a real risk in his case. And the European Court of Human Rights said, you may not deport anyone to a country where they are at serious risk of being tortured. Now, that is a decision that has been hugely unpopular with the government. They went to Strasbourg again in another case to try and upset it, and the European Court of Human Rights uh, stuck to its guns and refused to budge. Now, you can take two views. You 
could say, well, um, send him to India and let him get on with it. Or you could say, as they have, torture is something so repulsive uh, and so completely unacceptable uh, that one simply cannot uh, countenance an exercise of public authority which may result in somebody being tortured. Now, there's room for two views. I support the European Court on it, but it is, uh, I think, without doubt, the most unpopular decision that the European Court of Human Rights has given from the point of view of the governmental authorities in this country. But surely if, it's, and surely if it's okay to deport someone to a place of torture, you can't then jump up and down about rendition. It's really, we're really dancing on the head of the pin, are we not, if we say that we can deport someone to a place of torture, but, but if we do it sort of rather deliberately and specifically and get some very vital intelligence back, that's an abomination. I, I think um, that we in this country have every reason to be extremely proud of our record in relation to torture. Uh, as those of us who read the sort of history books I did as a child will remember, it used to be in medieval times the practice uh, to make somebody hold a boiling uh, a, a molten lead in their hand, and if it went septic, then they were guilty, uh, and they were duly slaughtered, and if it uh, didn't go septic, they probably lost the use of their hand, but they were regarded as innocent. Uh, and in 1215, that was declared to be a cruel and unacceptable procedure uh, by um, the Lateran Council that year. And there was a choice for the nations of Europe to make as to what they were going to do. Uh, we said we would stick to our jury, we would allow people to give evidence, um, and, and we would uh, entrust uh, guilt or innocence to the decision of a jury, and one witness uh, for the prosecution was enough. The countries of continental Europe adopted a different uh, rule, uh, which was uh, that um, you should either have two witnesses to the crime or a confession. Well, now, there are lots of crimes you don't get two witnesses. Uh, and so they needed a confession. And how better to get a confession than to torture somebody until they confessed? Uh, and this was an accepted practice in the countries of continental Europe until an amazingly late date. And there were 18th century textbooks of it, very elegant young men in powdered wig and hose and silk stockings, uh, putting people to the rack and, uh, and, and thumbscrew and this uh, sort of thing. Uh, so we led the way in uh, setting our face against torture. Now, almost every country in the world is a party to the torture convention, which is very swinging and very uncompromising in its terms. Uh, so, um, as, as I say, I'm a, a, a total opponent uh, of torture in any shape or form, and I don't think we should lend it uh, any countenance.